You've got some old hardware lying around, so wouldn't it be great to put it to work? Is it really possible to build a $500 server? Well, this beast, Blackthorn, is the result. Fully operational, but possibly the worst combination we could have chosen. So find out where we screwed up, so you save money. You'll need to consider what connectivity you need, how many PCIe slots will be used, and most importantly, do I even need this? What the heck were we thinking? Today we'll answer those, and your support helps us make better content like this, so please take a quick second to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, and subscribe to us here, all that good stuff. If you have hardware questions, leave them in the comments and we'll try to answer them. And any updated info on this video will be on the techspinreview.com companion post. And next video we'll have a follow-up on a cheap NAS build using new hardware. Let's get to it. Lock screen boring? We made one. Free download, link in the description. A quick summary. For a NAS, the hardest part will be finding a PC case with 8 to 10 hard drive base, though some rack mount cases can be modified to run quietly at a cost. The newer the motherboard and CPU, the better for your power bill, as operating costs will factor into the total money you spend on this. Choosing motherboards with onboard graphics solves the need to run in headless mode. Info on that is challenging to find. Your motherboard will need 2 to 3 PCIe times 16 slots, and Intel boards generally will have more PCIe slots for a SAS to SATA card to connect up to 16 hard drives, an NVMe adapter if your board's old, like this, and network expansion like 10 or 40 gigabit Ethernet. You'll need 16 gigs of RAM, and don't buy DDR3 as you can't carry it forward. A cheap small NVMe M.2 drive is perfect for cache, and for older boards without a slot, cheap $10 PCIe adapter cards exist, though you could use an SSD also. For more hard drives than your motherboard can handle, you'll need a SAS to SATA card that's in IT mode, SAS breakout cables, and SATA power splitters. Refurbished NAS hard drives are cheap on Amazon, and at 9 watts, 2 amps a drive at startup, if you spread the load on the PSU wiring, a 500 to 600 watt PSU should be fine with no graphics card. However, do research as drive idle power should be close to one watt. Old drives can use a lot more, ramping up operating costs quickly. Finally, case fans for cooling, and you'll need internet on another PC to grab Unraid. Unraid gets installed on a one gig USB stick, or better, which remains always plugged in, and Unraid requires an internet connection to your new NAS to set up parity and run the array, and we'll leave any Unraid questions below to the experts. Not factored in the cost, there's the Unraid license, any file syncing software, and importantly, a UPS, as you don't want to hit with power surges, and if you lose power, rebuilding your array will take a very long time. A uh, four terabyte parity can take around nine to 12 hours. Finally, your NAS may need backup. Cheap large external hard drives can stay offline until you're ready for your nightly or weekly backup. We're building a NAS, a network attached storage device, which is basically a hard drive that you have on your network that you can save files to, just like an internal hard drive. They can be small or big. Putting a server together on a budget depends on how complete of a PC you already have and how much storage you need. Old rack mount servers can be a good deal, but the noise they make means that they'll need to find a home outside your living area. Silencing some is possible, but adds to cost. The case will probably be the most difficult choice. Anything server with lots of hard drive bays will be expensive. 95% of PC cases won't have enough bays, but really try to find eight to 10 bays that fit your motherboard and side axis design like this is best with rubber drive mounts to minimize vibration. Drives in line with the case will make your job hard with motherboard or wiring making back axis tricky and likely poor front access with case metal or fans blocking the way and you need fans. And five and a quarter hot swap bays may look cool, but they can be 90 bucks a pop. The cheapest option we saw is a Cooler Master N300 or N400, though with drive installation with an ATX motherboard installed may be hard. DIYmediahome.org has a list of old huge bay cases, though a great one is the Thermaltake Core V71, which was $170, but all these are discontinued, so good luck. We'll cover a great new case next episode. So we researched and picked only cards and wiring off of eBay. Buying used, look locally on Facebook Marketplace or similar for our complete systems, as the parts already work together, saving time and money on parts hunting. The key will be, how do we keep things fast for now and have expandability in the future? And I can hear it already in the comments, nice cable management, bro. Hey man, I've got sleeved extensions, but they won't be in the finished build, so let's keep it cheap. So we got this whole unit for 130 bucks, but we screwed up. This board is an EVGA classified SR2 from 2010 and is probably the worst pick for a server build, but great demonstration of what not to do, eh? So you're looking for a motherboard with three PCIe Time16 slots and onboard graphics using a low wattage CPU, which is what makes this SR2 and dual CPU combo a horrible purchase, and we'll touch on this later. 
Intel CPUs often have integrated graphics on chip, enabling motherboard video out, but mainstream AMD CPUs often don't. That means no video out from your motherboard, even if it has a VGA or HDMI. One advantage AMD does have is unofficial support for error correcting or ECC unbuffered memory on their consumer CPUs. You just need to find a capable motherboard. And if you are gonna use the ZFS file system, this is recommended. This SR2 supports headless mode, which is booting without a GPU installed, as you can see, though a lot of motherboards won't. And the solution is a cheap $10 PCIe riser that'll plug into a PCI times one slot. So you can use an old long slot, low wattage graphics card. It's true you can dremel out the right side of a PCIe times one slot and the card will work. In the way components and motherboard damage are issues though, so do you want to chance it? Why do you need three PCIe times 16 slots? For one or two SAS to SATA cards, and old boards won't have NVMe, and the last for 10 gigabit or higher networking. Keep in mind some boards disable PCIe slots depending on your configuration, and some won't have BIOS options to enable all slots. If you find a sweet motherboard, by the way, please do drop it in the comments and we'll look at adding it to the techspinreview.com companion post. So you need RAM. And since we're using Unraid, four gigs is enough. Although if you want to run VMs, then figure 16 gigs or so for each VM. Just don't buy any DDR3. If your CPUs are using stock coolers, great. Just clean them first. But if they're noisy, you could use a Cooler Master Hyper 212. Old boards won't have an NVMe M.2 slot, but with a cheap $10 PCIe to NVMe adapter, you can use a stick lying around for a server cache. These circuit boards just have traces connecting the M.2 port to the slot. Now you won't be able to boot from it or maybe even see it in Windows, but Unraid saw the drive using either adapter. By the way, rear slot covers aren't necessary and may not fit properly. Don't force it, just remove it. You need NAS drives for a NAS, as they're built to run 24 seven and tolerate vibrations from adjacent drives, which are installed properly using all four screws and hopefully with rubber shock mounts. Don't use normal desktop drives as they'll die quickly in a NAS. Browsing Amazon's refurbished listings may get you up and running. Just research each drive's idle power draw, which should be one watt or a hair under. Most motherboards can probably connect six hard drives, but for more, there's PCIe to SATA two port or four port cards, but there's a better option. Considering a SAS breakout card supports up to eight, yeah, eight drives, we got an LSI HBA Fujitsu pre-flashed into IT mode, just $65 US. Each one of the mini SAS ports handles four hard drives and is pre-flashed so you don't have to mess around for hours in Linux. We grabbed mini SAS male to SATA breakout data cables and a few SATA power cables, which are male to five port SATA female cables. Finally, if your case has a five and a quarter three bay spot, these cage racks come with rails and a fan mount, which is essential. This $30 solution has no rubber shock mounts and three mil spacing between the drives, so you may want to leave out the center for ventilation. Do not run hard drives without fans on them. We'd prefer a fan up front, but our Xeon intake fan is just four centimeters behind, so what can you do? Embrace the jank. Please take a moment to hit like, get subscribed, and click the bell. It supports us, and you'll get notified of our latest videos and reviews. Your case needs cooling, and Arctic F12 120s are the budget go-to at 10 bucks, seven on sale sometimes. But at 14 bucks, Noctua's new non-poo color, gray-toned NFS-12B Redux 1200s deliver great airflow with low noise. They also have the NFP-12 Redux, high static pressure fans great for radiators and getting air through cramped spaces. For glass panels, Cooler Master has three packs of 120mm Sicko Flow or Halo ARGB fans for $50 and $65. A NAS power supply should be in good condition, 500 watts or more is fine, and we won't be using a graphics card. Reusing an old PSU, check it to make sure there's no rust anywhere. At power on, hard drives can momentarily peak at 9 to 10 watts at 2 amps before normal power draw. So for 10 drives, budget around 100 watts and 20 amps, which you can balance over your SATA and Molex wiring. If you're lucky and have a gigabit network port, you're set for now. And in the future, you could grab 10 gigabit RJ45 cards to take the easy way out, or 40 gigabit Mellanox Connect X3 Pros or better using QSFP, which will scale better. If you're not lucky and your old motherboard just has a 100 megasecond port, a one gig network card is 15 bucks, a 2.5 gig card is 30, and 10 gigs you can get for around 95-ish. These are all using standard ethernet cables, but you can pick up used SFP plus 10 gig optical for half that, though you'll need to buy and set up an optical network, which is great for equipment that's not set up in the same room. Our studio gigabit network will get an upgrade in the near future, but for now we'll pull our current project from this server directly to an editing PC's NVMe drive, giving ultra fast scrubbing for footage. Even though Unraid should put the project on the server cache, this cuts out any network lag and server drive response times, and we'll test this soon. 
to update server files, we're using a program called Always Sync. So as we edit in Premiere, using the editing PC's NVMe to scrub, changes are pushed back to the server. Always Sync has been reliable. I've used it for eight years to sync 267 gigs of MVs and music for DJing, and the last six for a full hard drive sync between PCs, currently sitting at 4.8 terabytes of data, 190,000 files, including text and assets. Always Sync is amazing, but there is a caveat. If you do changes on both machines without syncing, you'll need to sort out the discrepancy, though you can set up auto handling rules. But if it's running all the time on an editing machine and set to auto sync every minute, there should be zero issues and a license is 26 bucks, uh, 16 for a second one. Totally worth it. Next, get a UPS to protect your server and get it soon. We did an episode with CyberPower, link up here, covering options and runtime with various capacities, or choose another brand, just get protected. If you need to redo NAS parity on the array, that can take from 10 to 14 hours for each four terabytes. So 12 terabytes or more, you're looking at a full day. Can your business handle that downtime? Get protected. If you're not using your NAS strictly as backup, then you'll need to plan to also back up the files there too. How do you back up a 20 or 30 terabyte array of hard drives? Well, who's got two thumbs and sucks at Linux? This guy! So we'll use Always Sync to grab the data off the server and push it to the external hard drive. Uh, we'll get more later. This is probably easier than setting up rsync. If you find an easy Unraid array backup guide, tell us and we'll add it to our website post. Before we buy anything, well, what do we have on hand? Our oldest Asus motherboard has a Core i7-2600K and two PCIe, but it's 100 meg network port got zapped, so that was out. Our MSI V360 Gaming Arctic is in our media PC, uh, link up here for the Cooler Master TD500 mesh build we did with that. And it had NVMe and two PCIe x16 slots, but we didn't want to rebuild this PC. Our secondary editing rig is an MSI X270X Power Gaming with i7-7700K with four PCIe times 16 slots. It's perfect, but it has a cold boot bug which takes two or three starts to get it running, so maybe later. Amazingly, Facebook Marketplace was where we thought we struck gold. We lucked out, a fire sale, but it's a 10-year-old motherboard, so not that far out, I guess. So we picked up a EVGA classified SR2 with dual Xeon X 5650s at 2.67 gigahertz with coolers, uh, 40 gigs of HyperX DDR3-1600 memory filling all slots, two EVGA GTX 580 graphics cards, and an AMD FirePro Graphics V7900. I've barely even heard of FirePro, let alone seen one. Powers from a Silverstone ST1500 watt modular power supply, a beast, all inside a Lian Li PC V2120X case capable of holding the SRTU's huge HTPX form factor. Some tech's been loving to clean it all up, and we're good. This would have cost 5,000 bucks in 2010 money, parted out, maybe it's around $1,200, and we got it for a steal of just 110 bucks. So plugging in the graphics card, we actually lost use of PCIe slots three and four, which does happen, and I couldn't get them working again in BIOS either. Slots further down had no issues, and no trouble with the NVMe and uh, LSI SAS cards. From Amazon, we got three HGST 4TB and five HGST 3TB NAS drives, all refurbished, and we don't recommend them. We'll find out why in the cost power draw section. A couple of spare NAS drives got thrown in too. A huge time-saving tip for you. I've added info including the last four of the serial number on electrical tape to the drive backs. Since Unraid lists your drives by serial number, this info saves a lot of time troubleshooting drives with smart errors, getting too hot, and especially wiring issues. About 10 minutes taping all the info to the drives saves hours. And you'll need another PC to download Unraid and install it on a USB drive. Minimum is one gig, and USB 2.0 can be more reliable. Uh, we're using a SanDisk Ultra USB 3.0 16 gig, which is overkill. Plug in the USB stick into the rear motherboard I.O. and boot. Don't miss the GUI startup selection. If BIOS completes and there's just a blinking cursor top left, check in BIOS that your USB is set as the first device in boot order. By the way, the SR2's boot to Unraid network usability was about two minutes, five seconds. Using Unraid, your biggest hard drive has to be your parity drive. Since our biggest is four terabytes, we'll lose that out of the array, but the usable size is 32.5 terabytes, not too shabby. The Unraid lifetime license is 60 bucks for six storage devices, 90 for 12 hard drives, and 130 for unlimited. And the parity and cache drives do count towards this, though you can upgrade a tier for a cost plus 10 bucks. So, 110 for the whole case, 390 for all the drives, 500 bucks. If you downscale drives a bit, you can still get Unraid and hit 500. Additions were the PCIe to NVMe card for 10 bucks, and the LSI SAS card was 60, 
two SAS to SATA breakout cables at 15 each and two SATA power splitters at 15 each and cage mount was 40. So an extra 170 on top, but not necessary if you're starting small. Talking about the lowest cost server build, power draw is a huge factor and this is where we screwed up. With GPU and 12 drives, the power on spike saw 430 watts, 325 booting up and 300 after a minute with the array running. The Intel 5520 chipset and dual Xeon X 5650s are power pigs. As with 45 watt GPU and drives off, we hit 220 initial spike, 185 during boot and 173 getting into unraid. Insane. We also watched the hard drive purchases from these 12 NAS drives alone was 181 watts initial bump, 95 during boot and 82 into unraid's array. Unfortunately, these old hard drives gulp power roughly 15 watts initially and seven watts of idle. Compared to a new Seagate Ironwolf 12 terabyte NAS drive that powers on at eight watts and idles at 0.8 watts, that's an 88% energy saving. I realize Unraid has a 15 minute to idle setting which we ran out of time to test, but the verdict is clear, buy new drives and save long term. Anyways, without drives, the dual Xeon system is pulling 173 watts in idle and that's crazy. A new system can go from 80 watts high end to as low as 20 watts with minimal components and the right chipset. So the real difference is with old parts you save up front, new you save long term in your power bill. Well, I guess this will make an excellent doorstop. With a program like Always Sync to back up data to another hard drive, that's by far the cheapest option, but as you grow, you may need to think bigger. If you have old hardware lying around or get cheap parts, try your hand at this. We learned a ton in the process and hope we helped you too. If you get your feet wet and like having a NAS, upgrading sooner will see the cost offset by the power savings. Also a massive shout out to the forums at servethehome.com. Members there were really helpful with questions we had and upgraded info in the episode, so thanks guys. If you decide to pick up some gear on Amazon, clicking and searching with our affiliate links below will help us here with no extra cost to you. And follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at TechSpinReview, and we have posts up at TechSpinReview.com. We have new hardware and tech reviews coming, so be sure to check those out too. Now we seriously cut down this script, so we're sure you have stuff to add and some questions as well, so join the discussion down below. Please take a second to hit like, subscribe, the bell, and let us know how we can improve and we're interested to hear what you want to see reviewed, let us know and we'll try and get to it. We'll also try to reply to the hardware questions, but for Unraid software, we'll leave that for the experts out there. We really appreciate you watching this far, thanks for your time, and tune in for part two of this guide. Bye for now.